people on watching. And so Steve, I'm gonna hand over to you and why don't you begin our presentation this evening? Great, well, thanks very much, uh, Simon. So, uh, well, welcome everybody to uh, the second part of this talk, Dinosaurs, Dragons and DNA. Part two, we're thinking about dinosaur sightings, dinosaur sightings throughout history tonight. But uh, we did have a few problems with Facebook last week, um, that is to say, just getting live. Hopefully they're all cleared up tonight. And so what I'd like to do is just to go through uh, the uh, summary, really, of why this is important and what we said last week and then coming on to our talk for tonight. So why, why is this issue so important? I was talking to someone earlier and they were saying, well, this is not a gospel issue. Should you be spending so much time upon that which is not a gospel issue? Well, I'd like to say that I think it is a gospel issue. Why? Because it goes to the uh, question of the truth of Holy Scripture. And uh, that's why it's a gospel issue, because the Bible itself, its credibility is at stake when we consider the question of millions of years, which are not mentioned at all in the Bible, or of course, is the earth young? That has profound implications uh, for our view of scripture. What is the evidence? We're interested in evidence, and so we're looking at evidence tonight. Will you look at evidence with me? I say that to those who maybe are of a different mindset, a different point of view. Maybe you're a skeptic against the Bible and against the idea that the earth could possibly be young. I was once like that. Um, but thank you for tuning in. And I'd like you to look at the evidence and examine it with an unbiased mind. Let me make a plea then for you to do that. And of course, if we look at evidence, uh, it should affect uh, the, our verdict true or untrue and that has implications to our belief system and in fact to the way we live our lives so these are the reasons why it's this question is important and of course let's go to what God's word says Christians believe that God has spoken uh, not only through creation told us that he is there uh, by the things that he's made um, every of course uh, building tells us that there is a builder Every painting tells us as a painter, every uh, musical composition, every tune tells us there's a composer. Creation around wherever we look tells us there's a God who made these things. And Christians believe that God has spoken in the Bible. So this is no ordinary book. It's not a human book. Well, it is human, but it's human and divine. Holy men of old spoke as they were moved by the spirit of God. So the words on the page are the words that God's spirit wrote through men. And on the very first page, we find these words, let the earth bring forth the living creature, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth. The word in Hebrew there, behemoth, each according to its kind. That is to say that each great type of animal is distinct and different from other great types of animals. And no matter how long you leave them, into breeding, a cow will never become a cat. Uh, a, a, a dog will never become a pig. They are genetically different. They're each a different kind of animal. Genesis says that many times in chapter one. This, um, and that's of course what we find today. We've got much, many variations within kinds. So lots and lots of different types of dog, but they're all 100% dog kind. And that's what we find throughout the animal and plant kingdom. So there's the Bible picture. Let us make man in our image. That is the triune God speaking here. The plural God who is three persons in one God. Three persons in one being. Let us make man in our image. And of course, we ourselves are multi-component people. We have a body. We have a soul. We have a spirit we have a capability to interact with this living God. We have a spiritual faculty, which makes us different from the animals. You've never seen a dog say his prayers, have you? Put his hands to put his paws together because, of course, he has no concept at all of God. But every person, even though their ideas may be slightly different all over the world, men and women pray 
because God has put that sense of him inside him. Truth again of the Bible demonstrated in our everyday experience. The verse I'd like to speak to is this one. God made everything in six days, according to Genesis and according to Exodus, where he himself is speaking, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, all very good. And of course, if he made everything, does that include dinosaurs? Well, it must include dinosaurs. And of course, the Bible uh, picture on verse uh, chapter one of Genesis, God made animals and man, land animals and man on the same day, day six of the creation, including dinosaurs. So men and dinosaurs were contemporaneous. They lived at the same time. Adam, who classified the uh, the animals according to the would have also classified dinosaurs according to their kind. Now the issue is important because if all this is not true, if all this is uh, not correct, then we can't trust our Bibles, can we? And if we can't trust it on page one, how can we be sure about the rest? Some people believe, well, we just have to tell people John 3.16, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But actually a lot of people won't turn to John 3.16 if they believe John 3.16 is wrong because they believe their Bible's wrong. And so it's important to establish the truth of the Bible from the very first verse, which is the reason for the ministry of answers in Genesis. My question tonight, what about the evidence? We've said what the Bible says, and that's enough. But actually, the scientific evidence, true science, all, has always supported what the Bible has said. It's not been, uh, it's taken a while to catch up sometimes, but effectively, when the historical or archaeological evidence comes in and is truly known and the facts are known, it's always supported the Bible in every age of the church. The modern secular worldview, here we have the geological column going from the Cambrian period, 500 or so million years ago, right up to the Quaternary period at the top, one and a half million years ago, somewhere near the top, evolutionists are not quite sure, um, man appeared and of course you've got all these organisms found in the fossil record and dinosaurs there from the Permian to the uh, Cretaceous period, the last dinosaurs and of course that hundreds of millions of years scenario is very different to what we find in the Bible. Death, suffering, disease are all in that record, all of these things are dead and of course, cancers, we find thorns and thistles, uh, nature red in tooth and claw, one dinosaur biting another. Um, we get all of this. And of course, all before man evolved at the top. It's not true, according to what the Bible says. The Bible teaches God made everything very good. The interest, my scientific interest over the last 10 years has been in soft tissue that's been found in fossils. Um, and of course, the number of scientific publications since 1966 is 84. In our own publication last year, we did a review of this, um, uh, published um, in uh, Expert Review of Proteomics, uh, Proteomes of the Past. Um, and of course, 84 publications since 1966 is a lot. And some of these are in very prestigious journals. In other words, scientists across the patch have been finding soft tissue in fossils conventionally dated at millions and in some cases hundreds of millions of years old. How can that be? It doesn't fit. It's caused a great stir scientifically and there's a lot of work going on and we're just one group uh, uh, that I, I'm involved in that's, that's addressing this question and finding this soft tissue and of course trying to quantify it and, uh, and measure it and examine it and so on. I'll give you an example. What is soft tissue? Well, it's the squishy bits in our body. It's the uh, uh, it's the osteocytes and the uh, uh, trabecular uh, cells in our bones. And here's some uh, soft tissue that were found. Uh, reported 2007 to 2015. Proteins were actually found in dinosaur soft tissue. Mary Schweitzer published that work in bones, and then um, an English team 
uh, Batazzo et al. in Nature Communications in 2015 also found collagen in bones. Collagen, a very uh, a, a protein that's ubiquitous in bone, animal and human bones. It's a, it's a protein. And of course, it should have decayed long, long ago uh, if, if, uh, if the normal decay processes apply. People have measured the half-life for decay of collagen. It's well less than uh, millions of years. And yet we find it. Our own study at the University of Liverpool published a couple of years ago found exactly the same thing using a, um, a, a second harmonic a generation microscope, um, confocal imaging. Um, we were able to see modern bone, significant levels of collagen. That's on the, that's on the left. That's the green um, trace there. You see lots of uh, that gray forest of collagen in the bone, but also when we looked at a Cretaceous Triceratops um, from 65 million years, 66 million years ago, we find deep and shallow collagen remnants. So there's collagen, the same signal from modern bone we find in the uh, Triceratops, much less, of course, because it has decayed. But the point is this, a surprise, a great surprise to those who would have said no collagen, impossible to last for 65 million years, and yet we find it here. And of course, collagen is the that carb the bones um, can be carbon dated. And um, of course, the maximum age anyone can measure with um, carbon, radiocarbon is about 100,000 years uh, using a mass spectrometer, accelerated mass spectrometer. Most of them can't even get that low to that limit of detection. And the point is, I'm being generous there with that limited detection. But if dinosaurs have been extinct for 65 million years, then there could not. It's, absolutely, it's an impossibility that there could be any carbon-14 left. And yet there is. And we're not the only group who's measured it and found it. There's others around the world who've found carbon-14 in dinosaur bones dated from the collagen and also from the bioappetite fraction. And it's hard evidence. That is a, um, uh, a slam dunk if you play uh, basketball. It's, it's, it's strong evidence against millions of years because radiocarbon proves, uh, it denies a million year assignment. Um, and it certainly denies a multi-million year assignment for those, for those bones. So last week we looked at soft tissue. We looked at carbon dating. We looked at the original biochemistry in fossils worldwide. Um, let me just go through that again. This is a fossilized squid. You see the brown is the sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock, of course, means laid down by water. So this fossil, like all fossils or most fossils, vast majority, was laid down by a flood, flood waters. There was hundreds of specimens of these squids in this fossil graveyard in Salisbury in England. And it was an ink sack that was fossilized. But of course, and the, the discoverer, Dr. Phil Wilby said this, it's difficult to imagine how you can have something as soft and sloppy as an ink sack fossilized in three dimensions, still black inside a rock that is, he believed, 150 million years old. And he was able to uh, add a bit of solvent to the ink and draw the Jurassic squid, there it is. There's the ink pot and the pen, and the scientist was able to draw the squid reputedly uh, 150 million years old with its own ink. That's good ink, isn't it? And of course, he said this, some of these fossils are so have been so well preserved that they look as if they've only just died. You see, what his eyes are telling him, him is this, these are recent. And what his mind is telling him as he draws the squid this is recent. And as he looks at the ink and realizes it's still good, this is recent. But of course, his, his uh, belief is, but we know they're 150 million years old. And of course, this is, uh, this is the problem. Scientists are discovering soft tissue like uh, this ink in the sack, unfossilized and unable to be used. And of course, it doesn't fit with 1 million years, never mind 150 million years. So there's Jurassic squid. Don't forget Jurassic squid. 
that's original biochemistry. It's not a dinosaur, of course, but it's original biochemical found in a fossil, supposedly of a vast age, un unfossilized. That phenomenon has been found all over the world. Five out of the seven continents now, we have examples of original biochemistry. This is geographically worldwide and published. China, Europe, America, North and South Africa. And it's also those fossils, those, uh, that soft tissue is right the way through the column. So it's not only geographically worldwide, it's historically through the geological column. We find reports of soft tissue in the Cenozoic period, in the Cretaceous period, in the Jurassic period, in the Triassic period, in the Carboniferous period, in the, in the Silurian period, and even in the Cambrian period and the Orocereal period. Amazing, isn't it? Geographically worldwide and ubiquitous through the column. Soft tissue, original biochemistry, soft tissue in the case of dinosaurs, original biochemistry in the case of other other um, uh, other organisms. And of course, the number of fossil, if you can look at the top there, the number of fossil biochemistry reports, there's actually 14 papers reporting soft tissue in the Maastrichtian and 14 here. So it's fewer in the other, but nevertheless, they're down here. There's, uh, there's five or six papers here from the Jurassic plus the... So you find that these reports are reporting soft tissues right the way throughout the geological column. Is it really credible that these have been preserved soft over 500 million years? Or is there another explanation? I'd like to put to you another explanation here it is. The facts are billions of fossils sound, found in sedimentary rock. That means wa water uh, laid down by water, mudstone, etc. So it's mud and water and so on. It's sandstone. Billions of fossils found in sedimentary rock all over the world. Where did they all come from? And of course, even on Mount Everest, we saw last week at the um, we find sediments. That's water. A rock that had been laid down by water at the very near the summit. These are 8,520 meters and there's fossils and sedimentary rock on the top of Everest. Okay, you can check out that paper a little bit later if you want to review that for yourself. And there's an ammonite fossil there in, in situ um, from, um, from Mount Everest. Marine fossils on Earth's highest mountain. It was once covered by the waters of a flood. Some people look at the rocks and think, well, they must have taken years to form. And of course, if we go at today's very slow paced normal rates, a millimeter uh, a year or a millimeter uh, in a hundred years, then yes, you, you get millions of years if you do the calculation. But we also know for sure that if you have catastrophe, you get very rapid sedimentation, very rapid buildup of water laden rock. And here's a 30 meter cliff, 30 meters, of course, uh, that's almost 100 feet high. Um, and the Engineers Canyon formed not in 30,000 or 300 or three years, but actually in two days over a three year period, 30 meters of sediment near Mount St. Helens in uh, Washington state. So this is proof, eyewitness evidence, that sediment can, sedimentary rock can form very quickly. When you've got those sort of rates of sedimentation, it collapses the, the geological column uh, drastically. And of course, how do the fossils form? The Bible teaches there was a catastrophe. It was a watery catastrophe. It was not just water from the heavens, it was volcanic water generated from the earth beneath um, and that did destroy the world and all living creatures apart from the those kept alive on the ark of Noah and so another way to look at the fossil record if we start with our bible is we look at a worldwide watery catastrophe that laid down the sedimentary rock and all the fossils not over 500 million years, but in one year, 
and we have an eyewitness account of all the high hills under the whole heaven being covered in water. And of course, it's not just the Bible, though that would be enough. Many accounts, dozens, if not hundreds, of the great flood that destroyed mankind, um, and, and yet one man who was faithful to God and his family and the animals were with him on a boat, and they were saved. We get that story again and again. The details differ as, uh, as, this, uh, the, as they derive from the Genesis account, but there's been, in some cases, changes and so on in, in some of the local stories as they've been passed down. But the written account, the eyewitness account in Genesis, of course, has been the same since it was written um, by Shem uh, on the Ark of Noah. So the Bible picture is, yes, the fossils are there, yes, but thousands, not millions of years ago, God judged this earth. Maybe that's the reason people don't like to think about a flood, because the flood reminds man that God judges sin. He does, you know, he does judge sin. He will judge sin again, and he will punish sin, just as he judged the earth because of its sin, but saved those who trust in him. That is the gospel. He will judge sin again, your sin, but he will save you if you trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we did look at this little video last week. It's thanks to uh, the Institute for Creation Research in San Diego. I'd like to play it again and then we'll move on to our, um, our part two. The book of Genesis describes a catastrophic worldwide flood. Is there any evidence that floodwaters covered the entire earth? There certainly is. Genesis says that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Today, oceans cover about 70% of the globe. On average, they are much deeper than the continents are high. It looks like the water from the flood is still here. Continuous water deposited rock layers span whole continents. That doesn't happen with local or regional floods today. These widespread layers contain most of the world's fossils. At least 95% of these fossils are marine invertebrates like clams. And we find them mixed with land or swamp creatures like tree shrews, insects, turtles, birds, and dinosaurs. It looks like an enormous but short-lived flood buried them all with fast-moving water. The Earth's surface has flat areas, but also valleys and mountains. Some of the highest mountain peaks, including Everest, have fossilized marine creatures. The Great Flood likely formed many water-deposited layers on the ancient ocean floor and caused tectonic upheavals that buckled those layers into mountain ranges. And when the large amounts of water quickly drained away, it formed steep-walled valleys between the mountaintops. Most geologists say that the extensive rocks and fossils must have taken great lengths of time to form. But this extends today's slow-paced local geologic processes into the past by overlooking Earth's evidence for fast-paced catastrophic worldwide flood effects. Vast layers, fossil graveyards, and mountains and valleys all around the world point to a massive watery catastrophe. And the key to explaining all this is the global flood of Genesis. I'm thankful to the uh, Institute for Creation Research for allowing me permission to show this, uh, that video. Um, so today we come on to historical evidence that's inconsistent with the millions of years. We've looked at soft tissue and unfossilized dinosaur bones, and we've done some research and published some research on that ourselves. Um, we looked at carbon dating, um, incompatible with millions of years. We've looked at original biochemistry all over the world and all throughout the geological column. And now we look on something that's, I think, very easy I and mean, easy to understand. You don't need to be a scientist. You just need to look at the pictures and look at the evidence here. Let's think about dinosaur carvings. This is the Taprom uh, Temple in Cambodia. You can go and visit it. Members of my family have been and seen it. And um, of course, the, the guide, the local guide, will be pleased to show you the dinosaur. On one of the temple pillars embedded in the middle of the pillar there, you'll find some carvings. There's carvings of jungle animals. There's a water buffalo, there's a monkey, there's other things that the 
um, ancient architect as he decorated the pillar, carved it out of stone. He saw in the jungle around him. And in the midst of that collection of animals, we see this one. Now, I often pause at this point and say, to, if I'm giving this lecture live, I would say um, to a live audience, what do you think that is? And normally it's a child who put his hand up and say, it's a stegosaur, because all the boys and girls know these dinosaurs better than, than uh, the most uh, adults. And of course it is, it's a unique animal. These fins on the back are unique to the stegosaurus. And of course it's got the, uh, the, petition, the form and the, the, the fins on the back. And it's um, very easy to spot and well-known uh, dinosaur. And if you ask people, if you show them that picture and say, what's that? Uh, before you tell them where it's found, they will, they will normally, if they know anything about dinosaurs, they'll give you that answer. So it's a carving. The temple dates from 1186 AD, so it's approximately a thousand years old. And of course, it's hard evidence, isn't it, that dinosaurs and humans coexisted. If all the other animals on the pillar are jungle animals, well, why not this one? He had no museum to go to. He had no fossils. The fossils of Stegosaurus weren't dug up until the 19th century. The only way he could have had that carved on the pillar was to have seen one walking around in the jungle. Now, I, I've been doing a little bit of historical research, and of course, we find the counts of dinosaurs in uh, throughout the ancient world, and also up until the medieval period. And some of them by um, well-known historians. And this one I'm going to read to you is written by Dio Cassius, who was a Roman historian. And he, uh, he charted history in the second century BC. And at that stage of the game, though, Rome and, and Carthage here in North Africa, so modern day uh, Libya, Noman Carthage were at war. And it was the called the Second Punic War, about 218 BC. And Regulus was a Roman consul. He was fighting against Carthage on the North African mainland and the enemy uh, suddenly released or uh, brought a dragon. That's how it's described in the, uh, in the original Draco. Suddenly it crept up and settled behind the wall of the Roman army. But of course, very few, even great beasts would be able to withstand the might of Rome and the Romans killed it and they skinned it and they sent the hide to the Roman Senate where it was a source of wonder and amazement. When the dragon's hide was measured by order of the Senate, it happened to be amazingly 120 feet long and the thickness was fitting to the length. Now, Roman feet are slightly shorter than uh, a foot today, so it's 29.5 as opposed to 30 centimeters, but not much. Um, it's well over uh, 110 feet long and the thickness proportionate to the length. That's documented by a medieval uh, theologian called St. John de Messine, and you can get hold of the book. Uh, you can Google him or you can Google Gideo Tassius and find this, this, um, this account for yourself. What did they see? What beast has a hide 120 feet long? And the answer is, of course, a dinosaur, but nothing else has that sort of size. We've even got a description of a dinosaur in the Bible itself. Um, this is taken from the book of Job, written uh, in the la latter part of the uh, second millennium, so around about 1800 BC. Um, and God speaking to Job says this, look now at the behemoth. Remember that behemoth was the word in Genesis, but here we've got behemoth, a plural of majesty. It's a greater version. Look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips. His power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar tree, like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. 
he's the first or the chief of the ways of God. He's the greatest, you could translate that, greatest beast in the ways of God. Now, if you go through the original language and you note the description of behemoth, you find about 10 features there um, which do not correspond with known land animals, um, but they do correspond with a sauropod dinosaur. Let me mention a few. Size. Sauropod dinosaurs were absolutely huge. We'll, we'll see some dimensions in a minute, but we're talking in the range 35 to 45 meters long. That's the latest estimate. They are herbivore, okay? So they eat grass. They're not carnivorous. Their strength, uh, well, they're massively strong. Their bones are the strongest of all living creatures to support their 75 ton weight. Their tails can be up to 2.5 meters at their thickest end, which corresponds to the thickness of a cedar tree. And of course, a sauropod is, uh, has a distinctive bone structure. Its bones in its lower body are like bars of iron. They're solid and strong. But in the upper body, in its tail and its neck, they have hollow bones like tubes. That's the best way to translate that word beams because they're able to lift its head and lift its tail. It needs to have a lighter bone structure. So this double type of bone structure is reflected there in the Hebrew and, uh, and the other languages there of Job chapter one. And of course it fits the context so well. God is saying to Job who was resisting him at this time, look, you couldn't resist behemoth. How could you risk me who made behemoth at the same time? as I made you. Let's look at the world's biggest dinosaur, Argentinosaurus, discovered in 1987 in Argentina. There's been a few more discovered since then. Absolutely huge. Uh, length estimate is 39 meters long, 122 feet. Remember the Diocasius um, example there, how they measured the hide and it came to 120 feet. Its height 7.3 meters and its weight 75 tons. And of course, you guessed it, it's a herbivore. It's a plant eater. So I think one can safely conclude that the dinosaur sighting in the Bible is a sauropod dinosaur. Let's have another video clip from uh, Institute for Creation Research. Are dinosaurs in the Bible? Well, the word dinosaur didn't come about until Sir Richard Owen coined it in 1841. But the book of Job in the Bible does refer to a massive creature that God called behemoth, which had a tail like a cedar tree. Sounds like a sauropod dinosaur. God also said he made behemoth at the same time he made humans, which makes a lot of sense when you think about all the dragon legends from around the world. After all, what people called dragons were probably dinosaurs before the word dinosaur existed. St. George fought a dragon, so did Alexander the Great's army, and Marco Polo saw one while visiting China. In fact, Chinese historians feature dragons alongside other known animals in the Chinese zodiac. Cave drawings, tapestries, and carvings on other continents also show people and dinosaur-like creatures side by side. That makes sense, since scientists have found original soft tissues, like blood vessels and red blood cells, in dinosaur bones. Lab tests have shown that these kinds of materials break down quickly, so these dinosaur bones can be very old. As the Bible says, and science confirms, dinosaurs weren't here before humans. They lived at the same time because they were created on the same day. Once again, I'm thankful to Institute for Creation Research in Dallas there for permission to show these little videos. Let's draw some conclusions, shall we, from tonight's talk. Um, the secular worldview, the prevailing worldview, that which is taught in schools and universities worldwide, has a very, very strong belief in millions of years. They're needed, of course, to support the theory of evolution. 
which is allows which for many people is a convenient reason not to believe in God not for all but for many biblical worldview is very different it's opposed to and uh, Jesus said um, you know in the world we would have tribulation we we shouldn't expect always our our belief system the belief system given in the Bible to line up uh, with with secular thinking and if it doesn't we need to be prepared to stand on the biblical worldview it speaks of a recent creation you just do not find the word millions of years in the bible it's absent there's thousands of years ago yes and we can date that from the chronologies which are right through the bible from genesis right the way up to the gospel of luke which is the last genealogy all very good god's original creation but then man fell into sin and that's why there's such a mess today in the world that man is a sinner he's away from god and the world is in a bad way as a result god sent a flood in the past the world became so filled with violence and iniquity that god judged it with a worldwide flood and it was that that laid down the fossils and that those billions of fossils over the world laid laid down in sedimentary rock, laid down by water, are a testimony to the judgment of God. God does judge sin. And we can't fit those two together. There are many uh, eminent uh, theologians and philosophers trying to marry a millions of years of evolution worldview with a biblical one, but those two worldviews can't be reconciled. They're hostile. They're mutually exclusive. They contradict one another. If you're a millions of years of evolution person, you're not a Bible person. And conversely, if you're a Bible person, you don't find millions of years of evolution in the Bible. Recent research has confirmed the biblical picture. We found soft tissue in unfossilized dinosaur remains all over the world. We've measured carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. We found original biochemistry in fossils throughout the column and all in sedimentary rock, which is laid down by water worldwide. Evidence for a worldwide catastrophic, catastrophic extinction event is there. Not many extinction events, as the evolutionists believe, but one which laid down the fossil record, and it's called the biblical flood, the flood of Noah. When you think about it, the laws of chemistry and biology and everything else we know say that it should be gone. It should be degraded completely. That's Mary Schweitzer talking about soft tissue in dinosaurs, which, of course, she's the leading scientist who's found uh, many of these, um, these, these artifacts firsthand and investigated them over 20, 20 years. But in addition to the scientific evidence, in addition to the straightforward testimony of scripture, we also find eyewitness accounts through history and not one or two. Uh, we find multiple eyewitness accounts of the flood and of dinosaurs. They're called dragons because we didn't invent the word dinosaurs till the 19th century. And we find dinosaur drawings and carvings again in Egypt, the Nama palette. We find in France and in, in, um, in the UK, we find in in um, dinosaur carvings there on the tomb of Bishop Bell in Carlisle Cathedral. We find the Taprome Temple. We find dinosaur petroglyph on carvings in America and in South America, all over the world, dinosaur drawings and carvings. And so the recent scientific research and the ongoing historical research also confirms what the Bible teaches. Therefore, the conclusion is, friends, we can and we should believe the Bible as it was intended by its divine author. And now we're in a position, having established the truth of the first page, to turn to the, uh, the book of Genesis itself. It is God's word and it's true. Your word is truth, said Jesus. Did he just mean uh, the bits after Genesis? Or did he not refer to Genesis? He referred to Genesis on many occasions. Genesis is a book of history. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophets and the apostles, they all believed it as history. If they believed it as history, ought not you? 
if you are a Christian. God did once judge the world by a flood and only those in the ark were saved. God will judge the world once again and only those who are in Christ. The ark is a picture of Jesus. And just like those in the ark were saved, those who come into Christ and are united with him by faith will be saved. That's what the Bible promises. My challenge to those who listen is this. Are you saved? That's an important question to ask yourself. We come then to the verse that people say we should start with. I'd like to finish with it. You see, the Bible is true and therefore we can trust it not only in Genesis, but also in the Gospel of John. And here's a summary of the Bible message in one single verse. The Bible in a nutshell, someone has said. For God so loved the world. There is a God and the good news is he's a loving God. He gave that which was most dear to himself, his only begotten son, Jesus, who died in terrible agony and shame and uh, humiliation on the cross. We remember that at Easter time. But he died there so that those who would believe in him can have their sins forgiven and they can escape the judgment of God. Therefore, whoever believes in him, and it's by simple faith, we should not perish but have everlasting life. This is a great God who gave a great gift to a great number of people. It's a great offer. It's the greatest offer. But of course, it's a great tragedy when people turn their back upon the God who has made them and prefer their sins to trusting in he who loved them so much. That's the message of the Bible. We can rely upon it. It has a Genesis foundation. And it has, um, a, it's a true word, friends, that we can rely upon and trust in Christ for ourselves as our saviour. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Steve. Um, a great and, and powerful message of the truth of um, creation seen in the world around us and, and, and shown to us through history and science. We've, we've had a number of people watching tonight from different parts of the world, USA, Italy, Brazil, so it's um, great to see all you tuning in tonight. And we did have a question, Steve, from someone. Um, how would an evolutionist explain the fossils on the top of Mount Everest? So how would an evolutionist explain the fossils on the top of Mount Everest? Well, the answer to that one is you'd have to ask an evolutionist. <laughs> um, I think they would accept that, uh, ev that if there's sedimentary rock on the top of Mount Everest, and there is, and there's marine fossils on the top of Mount Everest, and there is, they would have to accept that Mount Everest was underwater. I think they would, uh, and we, it, it, so that's, that's a fact. I don't think anyone would deny that. Whether or not Mount Everest, uh, whether there was some mountain building after the flood uh, is a question that um, is very, it's very possible. And so Everest may not have been as high uh, then as it is today there was great the bible picture is there was great tectonic movement you see uh, after the flood as the continents were rearranged uh, we have no problem as christians and as creationists believing in tectonic movement as the the ancient continent of pangaea was, was was split out but we're just saying the time scale is where we're differing these things could have happened very very quickly so to sum it up I don't think the evolutionist would deny, you can't deny the marine fossils on Everest. Uh, he, would, uh, he may explain it a different way in the sense of a mountain building episode. I don't have a problem with that either because we believe there was tremendous upheaval at the time of the flood. And so um, uh, I, I'm comfortable with the idea of Everest being pushed up um, after uh, the flood uh, by, by, by some amount, who knows how much. Yeah. And what, what about the um, finding of these carvings of dinosaurs, for example, in Thailand or in Bishop Bell's tomb in Carlisle? Have you heard responses from the evolutionary community of how they um, try and explain those things? Well, um, it's amazing, really. You can go on the site and you type in the Tapro, you find various evolutionists responding to it. You go on and see what you think. Some of them think it was a hippopotamus. Uh, some of them think it was a rhinoceros. Uh, 
you see, because although it looks like a stegosaurus, and I believe it is a stegosaurus, if you're an evolutionist, you can't believe that. You're not allowed to come to that conclusion because it would defeat your worldview. And so you're scratching round, clutching at straws of other explanations. I did hear at one, one evolutionist who, who thought that, um, uh, that the ancient, the, the, the Cambodian who carved the temple uh, had found the fossil of a, uh, the bones of a stegosaurus. Well, why would he carve living creatures and then suddenly he finds a load of bones in the jungle and he carves that. I mean, it does, it does beg a belief, but people do try and come up with any other explanation other than the obvious one, yeah. which is the simple one. He carved the stegosaurus. It looked like, and it, the reason he, it looks like a stegosaurus because it was a stegosaurus. And the reason it was a stegosaurus because it was walking around next to the monkey and the water buffalo and all the other things that he carved. Simple. Yeah. So scientists, science should go for the simplest explanation, if possible. It's called Occam's razor. We go for the simple. We don't look for convoluted, uh, ancient, uh, you know, carvers trying to look for fossils and and so on. Um, no, we go for the simple one first, and that's what fits. Yeah, they don't they don't like it when the the evidence doesn't the facts don't fit with with their theory, do, do they? And it's almost as if they're defending their religion. Absolutely, that's exactly right. And again, I speak to an evolutionist, maybe someone who's listening. Do you know, you you would perhaps uh, laugh or or, or mock a, an adherence of another religion from Islam or, or Judaism or Christian, and say, well, they they they're bl they have blind faith. Could I ask you to just look at yourself at the minute and think of the faith that you've got in this evolutionary worldview? Is not that blind faith? Are you not holding a faith position? And of course, I'm saying that you're holding a faith position and you're holding it contrary to the evidence. Look at the evidence and go where the evidence leads. That's my appeal to the evolutionist who might be listening to tonight's talk. Yeah, and because we, we can see these things in God's word, it gives us great confidence for the Christian in God's word and therefore the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him. Mm -hmm. And if we don't believe God's word, it, sorry, that's that's it. That's end game over yeah. um, for, for a person's inquiry. It's interesting that when Jesus went to towns, he was able to do wonderful things, wonderful miracles, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, heal the blind and so on, and lepers. Wonderful stuff. But he said he went to Nazareth. He could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief. Um, and, uh, you know, God... Uh, won't accept uh, to do great things if we uh, if we want to re abide in an unbelieving uh, situation. Yeah. Well, thanks, Steve, for your time tonight. It's been another wonderful uh, presentation. Um, so again, my thanks to 